hope you all had a nice break. Welcome to a session, a session where I can guarantee you, you feel very much like home. Because what have you been doing at home for the last two years? Video conferencing. And here we have six people in this session, believe it or not, you might not believe it when you look at the stage, but Fitch, five of our uh, participants are joining us online. And first we'll have a little round of uh, remarks from everyone, after which we'll try to have a conversation here. Uh, and I think that sounds really familiar, like just like home, but no sweatpants this time. There were quite a few interesting remarks on uh, the session on the role of data in disasters and pandemics this morning. I'm sure we'll touch on uh, some of the same themes here, but we want to take a step back now to discuss uh, one of the pillars of effective data use, that is trust. Or to approach it from the other side, distrust in data. You'll remember that the president of Microsoft, Brad Smith, called this cause number one during our opening ceremony on Sunday. We are witnessing in recent years that whole parts of society uh, have developed an inner opposition to inconvenient facts. Climate change comes to mind, where some of the most fundamental statistics are still called into question in certain circles. Or take vaccine efficacy, that was something we discussed uh, this morning as well, where no amount of uh, scientific data seems to satisfy some of the skeptics. What are the reasons behind such rejectionist movements? Well, some of that is politically motivated, of course, but in large part, this is also a misunderstanding in the data community, I think. You see, accurate, accurate and granular data, even quality information, just isn't persuasive, persuasive in and of itself. People don't believe in data points. People believe in narrative. People believe in stories. It's all about how these stories are told and how the narratives are formed based on data that can stand up to scrutiny, both what comes to quality and privacy as well as transparency. And that's what we'll discuss right now. We have uh, on our panel James Lowry. He is the founder and director of the Archival Technologies Lab and assistant professor at the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies to Queens College at City University of New York, where he joins us from. Hello, James. Then Pam Dixon, the founder and executive director of the World Privacy Forum based in Oregon. You can see a little green in your back. That, that's very, <laughs> very Oregon <laughs> to me. It's, uh, I love that neck of the woods. Then Julia Lane, author and professor at the NYU Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Hello. And here with me is uh, Anirudh Berman. He's a fellow at Carnegie India. From Zambia, we are joined by Molenga Musepa, the interim statistician general of the Zambia Statistics Agency, and from Mauritius by Rudesha Madhu. She is Data Protection Commissioner at the Prime Minister's Office. Hello, everyone. <coughs> and of course, we want to hear from you as well. If you're participating online, please use the chat window on our virtual platform for any questions and comments. You'll find that on the session page. Please note your country and sector there as well. Now, First, ask yourself, what kind of data do I trust? When I thought about that question, I realized that as journalists, we often turn to archives for really reliable long-term information. But as you know, there's many kinds of archival data, wide-ranging standards regarding quality, privacy, and transparency. Our first speaker can tell you all about that. James Lowry has researched archives and records management in Australia, Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean. He currently serves as the director of the CUNY Archival Technologies Lab, which he also founded. James, please. Great, thank you very much, um, and good morning, everyone. Um, so this problem of trust in data is not new. It's actually hundreds, if not thousands, of years old. And over that time, 
um, the field of archives and records management has developed um, a number of methods for trying to assure the trustworthiness of, of information. And so fundamentally, these, um, these controls are about using metadata to create audit trails, about assigning responsibility for custodianship so that at any point in the data lifecycle, there is a named person responsible for whatever is going on with that data, and then designing systems that we can audit um, and these systems need to link the data to their provenance, that is where they come from, and also um, to their custodianship. Um, but unfortunately, many studies have shown uh, that these kinds of controls are not always in place um, with, particularly with, uh, let's say, open government data. Um, and so I would like to refer um, the audience to a book that was published last year called A Matter of Trust. It was published by um, the University of London Press, um, edited by Anne Thurston, and you can find that um, online as a PDF for free, um, University of London Press website. Um, so that really goes into the nitty gritty of like, what are the problems um, in relation to the sustainable development goals and quality and trustworthiness of data. The problem, um, that arises when we do not have these controls in place for uh, public sector information is that we can't hold governments to account, we can't plan services, um, we can't develop effective policy. Um, and so I can think of uh, two examples here. One is the Eyewitness to Atrocities app. Um, this is the problem of, okay, if we're going to record video footage of police brutality, how do we make sure that that footage is evidential? And it is exactly through these kinds of controls. Um, and so the Eyewitness to Atrocities app has built these controls into um, a video recording app. And then the other example is the Rohingya Project's R archive, um, which seeks to digitize records held by the Rohingya people in diaspora with a view to making them as evident, these digital copies as evidential as possible so that those people may one day be able to reclaim citizenship or property rights um, and so on. Um, so I started working on this problem back in 2010 and back then there was a big push to release government um, data out onto the web. And at that time, I mean, things are getting better now, but at that time there was really a lack of provenance data, chain of custody data and so on. Um, and so I've been arguing for um, the use of technical standards that were developed by the archives and records management community. Those standards are out there um, and the evidence shows that when they are applied to data curation, they make for more robust data. But I think the problem now is a question of scale. As we move increasingly into the world of big data, how do we apply these controls um, in ways that um, are increasingly computational or automated. And this is a question that is being looked at by an international network of researchers called I Trust AI, um, based at the University of British Columbia. That work is just starting now, but I'd encourage people to, to check them out. So that's I Trust AI, looking at these questions of quality and trustworthiness in big data. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, James. That's uh, really interesting to uh, hear what you said about the uh, Rohingya people. I think it's a striking example and also uh, about uh, the need for custodianship uh, and to have the whole information chain in sight, uh, if you will. And I think we'll get back to that in our Q&A session for sure. Now we'll hear uh, from a woman who focuses on one of the key reasons for trust for trust or distrust in data and data use, privacy. Pam Dixon has founded the World Privacy Forum back in 2003, long before privacy issues became a common concern. What's more, Pam has written numerous much noticed publications and is a winner of the Consumer Excellence Award. Pam, we're all ears. Oh, well, thank you so much. I am delighted to be here and thanks to the UN for inviting me to take part in this uh, discussion today. I really appreciate it. I want to focus on three brief points and make sure that I stay within my allotted time. Um, so trust in data ecosystems requires uh, 
established baseline work around what has become new social norms. And this, this includes all of the emerging issues around the new uses that in the pandemic we are noticing for the use of private sector data. So there's a lot to unpack here. So let me uh, lay things out in three brief points. Let me begin with social norms around data. So I think that we all know, and we now have good documentation that the pandemic has greatly accelerated uh, use of digital data and has increased digitization globally. And um, this has changed what kind of research data sets are being utilized and being sought. Now, because it's a pandemic, there has been a period of enormous grace, and I think that this will, of course, at some point come to a close. But we can observe right now that the pandemic has occurred at a crucial time in history. So if you think about privacy, privacy is a subset of data governance, and modern data governance began in the 1970s. It began initially in Germany and then also in the 1970s in the US with some very large pieces of landmark legislation. All of Europe, of course, followed with the early EU 9546 data privacy directive, followed by um, the general data protection regulation. And now, today, we have more than 144 jurisdictions across the world that have at the national level some form of modern data protection regime. And typically what happens with, for example, national statistical offices and other research, there is a significant exemption. And the exemptions do apply. However, the, the data protection regimes have changed social norms. Since 1970, there has been plenty of time to change these norms. And I believe that this is the unspoken thing that we're really facing right now. We have financial sector data, health data, individual level geospatial data, aggregate level geospatial data, telecommunications data, and other data sets that are seen as very, very valuable and necessary during the pandemic. But if you look at the legislation, not all of these data sets may be available or they may be siloed in regulatory silos. So what is to be done here? Which brings me to my second point, which is modern data governance. And I want to go back here to actually Albania. Um, I was in Albania in 2019 prior to the pandemic, of course, and there was a global privacy assembly and a there was a side event where a major global pharmaceutical company showed us their data governance system globally. It was extraordinary. They had data provenance tag. They had data standardization and data standards tagged to each individual um, piece of data. They had the regulatory status of each piece of data along with the, the legal restrictions. Um, they had significant rules around re-identification and aggregation. It was global and it was uh, in some cases real time, but most often it was in near real time. This is the modern data landscape. And this, if you look at within each jurisdiction, you'll find that there are very slightly different rules, which has led to enormous fragmentation. Um, and that's a whole topic for another time. But uh, we do need to reduce this fragmentation and we need to respect national boundaries, but find a way to harmonize approaches to the use of data and to um, data governance within data ecosystems. So I wanted to um, then move to the, the next point, which is how on earth do you do all of this risk assessment and all of this work to create a very clean data ecosystem? You present the data ecosystem, but it is not trusted. What is the key component here? And there's been so much work done in this area, and what has been discovered already is that it is public consultation that really makes the difference with trust. If you have a modern data governance system, there that meets the norms that have been developed now since the 1970s and you have not done public consultation it may not matter much but if you have done public consultation it matters a great deal and let me give you a very uh, uh, real example in the united states and particular cities through the u.s 
you will find that face recognition systems, which can have utility, have been banned. In the, the UK, where they still also have face recognitions, they were not banned. What is the difference between these two systems, which are using nearly identical technologies? The difference was how they were deployed. In the UK, they were deployed with the data protection authority working with the purveyors of these systems and the government setting the systems up. They were done according to the social norms. The systems still exist, yes. They're still utilized, yes. The benefits of the data are there, yes. But the drawbacks have been mitigated. In the US, there were no data protection authorities to conduct these kinds of public consultation. So I do think that this is a very, very important component, particularly in the issue of the need to look at how we can manage um, the, the use and the expansion of private sector data. This is a very, very difficult point, and it will, will require a great deal of work in establishing uh, modern data governance, which, by the way, is a very important work stream um, at the UN right now. So in conclusion, I am going to leave comments about um, uh, working with data protection authorities to Drudisha Madhub, one of the most talented and high profile data protection authorities in the world right now. So um, thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Pam. The privacy issues, that's something that's uh, at the heart of many discussions I've overheard in the hallways as well here at the forum. But next we turn to another crucial component in building trust and that's transparency. This goes hand in hand with accountability, of course, which can be challenging in a world uh, that's more and more relying on automation and artificial intelligence. These are the areas of expertise that our next contributor specializes in. We welcome the co-founder and director of the Coldridge Initiative that strives to enable data for use of social good, Professor Julia Lane. Julia, um, we cannot hear you yet. <coughs> Let's see. I told you it's going to be like a, a video conference. No. No. Let's see. We'll try that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's much better. Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know what happened there, but uh, we'll we'll take it without the. Uh, you can't hear me. Yeah, that's oh, that's uh, the, um, that's how it is. Now or we can hear you. Um, please go on. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me the chance to chat. Uh, please put a thumb up if you can hear me. If we're good. Great. Okay. So um, the, the two comments, your introductory comments and the comments from Pam, I think were right on the money. Uh, you identified, you know, the, how can we develop trust and, and accept accurate data? And then also think about uh, protecting privacy. So I am going to um, argue that one of the major challenges that we have is that uh, the quality of the data that we have produced is declining. Uh, our ability to use public data uh, is degraded in large part precisely because of what Pam said, the imposition of privacy rules from by a set of high priests rather than engaging with the community. And so mm -hmm. what I talk about in my book, which is democratizing our data, is uh, what is the problem? So, so let me characterize the challenge that we have. Uh, and for all that we think about uh, the uh, push against data and science, in fact, the quality of the data that have been produced, uh, if we just think about unemployment statistics, the, the data are uh, demonstrably um, poorer and measuring concepts that are not particularly useful. The measures that were developed 19, in the 1930s and that are still collected with 1980s technology survey methods, which in the pandemic went 
went down the tubes. Our health statistics, Pam talked about, uh, and of course I'm gonna talk about the United States, but our data on police killings that are produced by the Department of Justice have are, uh, about half of what the actual killings have been. Uh, the data on gross domestic product, archaic methodology also developed in order to respond to the Great Depression. And, and so uh, my analogy here is if we are going to trust data, the uh, sources and use of the data have to be democratized. In other words, uh, here's a classic example. It used to be that whether data were produced in Washington, D.C., um, over 100 years ago, uh, in the 1900, a massive hurricane was heading towards the Gulf Coast, just as now, and uh, the National Weather Service said it's going to hit in Texas, in, in um, Florida. It actually hit in Texas, and, the, and uh, over 6,000 Americans died in Galveston. After that, what happened was the National Weather Service reorganized, collected data at the local level. You now, instead of getting, uh, for example, unemployment data, which is reported centrally on the first Friday of every month, you get detailed data on weather, on wind, rain, precipitation, that is presented and trusted by people because it's generated and tested locally. So I would call for a rethinking of our data collection systems, and I would rethink uh, the centralization of data and pushing it out to the local communities. So I think that the challenge that we faced in the trust in data is the data are not to be trusted. Well, that's uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, along with that uh, hurricane example of yours, which is uh, quite striking. And you might have noticed, by the way, that our first three guests uh, in this session are all based in the US. That's uh, not a surprise given the topic. But we now turn to three perspectives from other countries, India, Zambia, and Mauritius. Here to elaborate on data protection and issues of state surveillance is Anirudh Berman from Carnegie India. He has worked extensively on privacy and data protection issues, also currently in the parliament, as I understand. So you have your work cut out for you because we all know that uh, India uh, quite soon is going to become the largest country in the world. So please, Anirudh. Thank you. And I'd like to begin by saying it's a great pleasure to be here in person. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, what I want to do is to give a slightly different and more optimistic perspective on trust. And based on what's going on in India, I think the problem is not so much about building trust, but about maintaining the level of trust and not eroding it. And I'm going to take some examples from slightly different sectors, because we are a low-income country transitioning to a middle-income country. And questions of financial inclusion, social uh, benefits become more important. And what's happened over the past decade is that India has undergone extremely rapid digitalization. Uh, for a time, and I think even currently, we are the fastest growing uh, major country in the world, adding number of, uh, in the terms of number of telecom subscribers being added every year. We are now the highest per capita consumer of data uh, in the world. And this, at the same time, coexists with the fact that we also have a large number of data breaches, cybersecurity incidents in the world. So what's happened is extremely rapid digitalization that has also enabled a lot of other services to reach out to people. For example, financial inclusion. Many, many people have been able to open bank accounts using mobile phones and other documents and biometric ident identification systems that were simply una unavailable before. Similarly, a lot of people have been able to receive state subsidies that have been much better targeted because these public uh, identification systems have been developed. We've developed a national payments infrastructure that is now clocking around 3 billion transactions every month. So that shows that there is a significant level of trust, uh, which is in some sense also born out of necessity because this amount of digitalization is also opening up pathways for people to become entrepreneurs for the first time. It's lowering barriers to participate in markets to start businesses. 
And this is pretty important in an economy where most of our industries are small. 90% of uh, Indian firms are actually small and medium enterprises. So in this context, data has actually become a tool of empowerment. It's enabled uh, the Indian population to actually make large-scale productivity gains. And it's actually lowering the costs of starting new businesses and to uh, diversify from their traditional lines of businesses. Uh, so if you want to take a loan, it's become much easier to do, throw, uh, do so via a mobile app. That was simply not possible before, right? And here the question of trade-offs become more important. So there is a trade-off between giving up control over your privacy or your data and the benefits you receive in, in return for it. And for populations who are largely low-income populations, I think those trade-offs become much more sharp because the gains from giving up some of your data in return for financial benefits, better targeted subsidies, become far more important and far more advantageous. So the question in situations like this is not really about how do we build trust, because that trust is already there because out of necessity. People are participating in these markets, are actually giving up information in order to get benefits from the state, from private sector players. The problem is, how do you actually maintain this level of trust? How do we make sure that we don't erode this level of participation in the digital economy? And here I think data protection legislation is important to actually prevent harms from occurring to consumers, from actually making sure that this level of trust and participation in the digital economy is not undermined, and therefore we actually have to prevent harms from occurring to consumers. So there have to be mechanisms where uh, we have some rights to con given to consumers to actually access the data better, to have grievance redress systems when there are errors and imperfections in the data that's collected by them. And also we need independent regulators who can make sure that the data that's stored is actually not being misused uh, in different ways. So I'll stop here for now. It's inter interesting what you said, that it's born out of necessity in a way. Isn't it then also uh, prone to uh, abuse by, by state actors as, as well as uh, private companies? Yes, that's always a risk, but for private sector companies, the incentives are compatible to some extent, right? I mean, if they abuse the trust of their consumers, they are not going, they are going to lose those consumers. It's a bigger problem with state entities because in some sense, they are monopoly state uh, service providers. There's no one else who's providing that service other than the state. And that's why I think the oversight and actual con uh, discussion on how the government stores, collects, and uses this data is actually very important. So we need a lot more deliberation on uh, what can different kinds of data be used for, how should it be stored, can it actually be mixed or used by a different government agency or not. And I'd like to preface a lot of this by saying we currently don't have a data protection legislation in India. It's still in parliament, it's still being debated. A lot of these issues will become clearer but even then, there will be these areas or lacunae in the law, loopholes that uh, governments might want to exploit. And if not for malicious intent, but purely for reasons of uh, actually building capacity and competence, right? Uh, there is a pressing need to collect this data in order to deliver services better. And that data is already sitting there. So rather than go out and collect the same data again, why don't I just take this data and use it for my own purposes? And that leads to all kinds of other problems and harms emanating from this kind of behavior. So we need a lot more discussion on how to actually restrict the scope of this uh, kind of behavior. Yeah, but let me ask, you now refer to uh, abuse by government, but there's um, also companies that live off data. And let's take Facebook. In India, that's much uh, more than just a social platform. It is, it is at the heart of the economy for a lot of small businesses, and boom, yesterday, today, <laughs> certainly it was all gone. Yeah. And theoretically, that would mean, okay, the trust is lost, and people turn to another platform. But can they? Because their connections are all on Facebook, so they don't really have a choice, do they? No, absolutely, and uh, I think this is going to be a bigger and bigger problem as these platforms get larger and larger. Uh, and I think the more the size and the more the market power, the more difficult it is going to be to make sure that some basic minimum standards of quality are met. 
uh, that makes it more important for there to be some kind of regulation so that at least large tech firms, which the Indian bill calls significant data fiduciaries, at least they are hold, held to a slightly different standard of accountability than many other service providers. If, if I could jump in here, Please. that is what makes this current situation so worrying. We, you opened up with exactly the right point. We need to be able to trust our data. We need to have a strong public data infrastructure and uh, because the alternative is the private sector and that is unambiguously not to be trusted. So what we have to figure out is how to democratize data so that people trust it and build uh, an engagement uh, system as was done with the National Weather Service in the United States, you know, a hundred years ago, where people themselves can understand how the data are produced and how they are used and how they are protected. And it, I think we're in a, a real crisis. You're, this is a, a well-posed uh, problem and plenary. And I'm sure we're we'll, going to talk about this later, but um, we still have uh, more inputs, uh, two to be exact, two from Africa that I want to bring in. Here, we'd like to hear from a national statistical office, uh, as these institutions are often at the heart of both generating data and making it uh, usable, understandable for the broader public too. And joining us from Zambia now is the interim statistician general there, Mr. Mulenga Musepa. Um, thank you very much. Um, our, our, my intervention basically would uh, draw on what's happening in Zambia. <coughs> First and foremost, uh, prior to 2018, we had two, two acts that governed the, the collection and dissemination of data. That was the Census uh, and Statistics Act 1955 and the Agricultural Statistics Act 1964. Basically, a more disintegrated, fragmented kind of statistical system. These two acts were repealed in uh, 20, 2018 to bring in what you may call a modern, a modern act which aims at um, establishing an integrated and coordinated statistical system. So you have now the, uh, the, 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 the act also providing for the formation of an apex institution, now the Zambia Statistics Agency, uh, which was most like a regulator. So um, in the national statistical system, you will have the Zambia Statistics Agency as a national statistical office as well as all other statistical agencies that produce data. Now, and uh, we've come up with uh, what we call a national uh, strategy for development of statistics, which in a way, including the act, domesticates a number of uh, provisions under United Nations um, fundamental principles of official statistics, as well as African charter on, um, on, um, on statistics. Now, in terms of uh, basically the, the national statistical system, to enhance the, the trust, the system has um, a platform for full engagement of all the statistical players in the, in, the, in, the, in the system. And therefore, the development of the national statistical development, the development of the national strategy for development of statistics uh, was more or less like a bottom-up approach where we involved a number of uh, stakeholders. These are statistical producers, statistics suppliers, the media, the ministries, um, and all sorts of uh, um, engagement. And with respect to that, we feel that if you've got a national statistical uh, committee, uh, producers committee, you kind of uh, enhance the understanding of how data is collected, how it's processed, how it's stored, and how to ensure confidentiality, okay? And if you do that, there is a chance, there's a chance that uh, the data will be, will, be, will be trusted. But also the act touches very much on the need to protect uh, personal data collected for statistical compilation processes. We also have a complementary law uh, known as the Data Protection uh, Act, uh, which also will augment the, 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 the modern act uh, dealing with uh, statistics, which also provides for an effective system 
for the use and protection of personal data. It also looks at regulation, regulating collection, use, transmission, storage, and otherwise processing of the data. So we, we feel that all these things should be able to point towards trust and more importantly, protecting the data. And uh, the way we view the, the data on seals, uh, trust and protection. This um, a trust must not only come from the National Statistical Office, but it should be trust within the entire National Statistical System so that all the administrative producers of data, we work together and we ensure that they comply with the provisions of personal data protection. And on an international level, we feel data can be protected if we, we implement a number of statutes as provided for in the, um, in, the, in the international statutes. So for now, that's what we are basically doing in Zambia to, to try and ensure trust in the data and specifically to protect personal data. And therefore, I increase participation of the data producers and suppliers so that we've got a robust uh, data system that can respond to the increasing needs of uh, the various stakeholders in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Malenga, and um, your remarks touched on the theme of, uh, of data stewardship as well, which is something that the, the UN um, is, is well positioned um, in our the, uh, national statistical office offices as well. As actually, our NSO here in Switzerland um, has a program there. It's enabling users to access metadata on a groundbreaking scale. So if you find some other Swiss, uh, they will tell you all about it. But before we go to the follow-up questions, uh, let's hear from our last speaker. She's in charge of data protection in an island nation where connection and data exchange with the rest of the world is paramount. And you already had a little trailer that she's brilliant. So speaking from Mauritius, Data Protection Commissioner Drudesha Mathu. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm seriously very glad to be joining the United Forum today. And thank you, Pam, for the nice words. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I would like to start with just two main points. Is that you have trust and you have data, right? And if you want to define trust, how would you be defining trust, actually? Because it's such an elusive concept. So what are actually the pointers that you will rely in trust to say that the word itself is trustworthy. I would give you just a small indication. If you take trust from a citizen-centric approach, it's got a different meaning. If you take trust from an economy and state actor perspective, it's got absolutely a different meaning. So the measurement of, of trust, actually, is something that we are all grappling around the world today. And this is why trust is still something we haven't been able to achieve in any of, uh, across the world, in any of the data governance frameworks that we have, data management, whatever the name you give to data handling. So this is the problem with trust. And when you say trust in data, actually data, it's people, right? People's information. We're not talking about whether uh, data, we're talking about people's information. This is where we have problems with trust. It's about people's data. And people's data are actually what they are. So there's no problem to trust people's data. The problem is when you take the data outside the biological uh, 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 body of a human, you bring it to a machine or you bring it to a context, and then because it's being handled in so many ways, actually sometimes distorting the data, abusing the data or properly handling the data as well. This is where we have the problem of trust. And we always say that we need data protection principles and standards across to be able to protect people. Let us be realistic. The economic 
powers in play right here because if we've got the state, we've got many economic blocks which are also powerful and they are the ones handling data. And the small citizen is just a weak individual. Obviously, there are going to be problems with how the individual is being sacrificed for other purposes which are more noble in national interest, national security, etc., etc. And sometimes the citizen as well is gaining from that sacrifice. But where the problem actually began is where the citizen is completely ignored and thrown out of the picture. And you bring that economic and national interest here and you say, you've got to follow me. This is where the citizen is threatened. This is where he becomes weak and this is where he needs protection. So this is data protection. Data protection is not only about data by design and by default, having all the technical safeguards in play to protect the data. It's the more important protection is that other citizen who has given you the data and you cannot dissociate the data that the citizen has provided to you from the citizen himself. So when we do the dissociation, this is where there is no trust. But if you can still link the data, if you can still identify the data with that individual and the individual is in control of what he can control, this is where trust will be reinstituted. Otherwise, we should not be talking about trust because it's like you, you ask me for my data, but at the end of the day, you steal it from me, right? And when you steal it from me, I have no control. And when I have no control, obviously I will have problems with trust. So if we want to demystify, you know, the basics of trust and data, this is where we actually have to start somewhere. And it's here, you see? So this is what I wanted to say, but let me just add some more elements uh, before I conclude my, my small presentation, is what is the success rate, you know, like statistics-wise? The success rate of profitability of data in all transparency for economic actors and uh, uh, state actors. What is the test, the success rate of profitability for citizens? If you give me that answer, and in terms of percentage, you will see the clear imbalance that the interests at stake are actually who is being protected, who is being neglected, and who needs uh, you know, instant protection. So these statistics, we may be having them nationally, but we don't have global statistics on how the citizen is being prejudiced, is being harmed. So if we talk about statistics, so let me just end my small presentation here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dudesh. It's almost a, a philosophical uh, approach that uh, uh, people are data and the data need to uh, be in contact with those uh, people. I would like to get uh, uh, Julia's point of view here as well. Uh, what's your experience working with really large data sets regarding these issues? Uh, balancing data protection and privacy on the one hand and also ensuring access on the other. So thank you so much and I'm sorry I'm going to have to jump in just a minute. Uh, I think we have a great deal of reason for optimism because I think new technologies now enable data to be accessed in a secure and confidential way without mucking up the data to the extent that Pam and, uh, described. So um, we can allow minorities, underrepresented minorities, to understand how uh, data are generated, how, um, what assumptions are being made that can result in bias and so on. Uh, if, the, if we have uh, secure uh, computing environments, and rather than thinking of data being binary, where it's completely private, where only a few people 
in a centralized environment get access or completely public where anyone like a 14 year old high school student can access it. You can have tiered access. So you can have gradations of uh, trusted individuals have access to increasingly confidential data. And so the democratization takes place because multiple eyes can be on the process by which statistics are generated, not just one small group of high priests. And I think that's the key here, is how can we use new technologies and new approaches so that it's the people and that are developing the data and the trust. I'm very sorry to have to jump. I had an action-inducing event. What a joy to meet everyone, and thanks for being such a great moderator. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. We understand. Thanks for uh, taking part. And I, I want to uh, take that point uh, about modern technologies. And I was uh, thinking of something uh, you said, James, that there's little to no documentation of, of, of provenance or uh, custodianship at many open government data portals. Could new technologies, um, I, I'm thinking the likes of blockchain and stuff, uh, could that make a difference here? Yeah, thank you for your question. I think, you know, what's been common across the presentations is this need for transparency and the fact that, you know, individuals, and I use the word individual rather than citizen, because I think we need to understand that there are uh, people for whom uh, the state um, makes decisions about inclusion and exclusion, where this kind of data is actually really a life or death matter. So, um, you know, thinking about how individuals access um, uh, information about the data, so the metadata, um, I think you're right. I think blockchain, you know, it has many of the features um, of the kinds of systems that I was speaking about because there is provenance information, there is, uh, you know, checksums that allow for us to uh, make assessments about the authenticity of the information. Um, I guess um, something that comes up for me with these new technologies is though this question of inclusion and exclusion. Um, you know, the technical know-how that is needed to understand and make judgments about these systems is really beyond a lot of people. And so I think we need to do a lot more work to democratize STEM education and to open up um, knowledge about these kinds of systems to the people that we um, are seeking to, to work with um, and to serve. And, and just one final point um, before I give up the, the floor, I would like us to make sure that we don't conflate participation with trust. Um, a lot of government systems require um, participation in order to provide access to a service to enjoy some kind of right. So um, just because a, a member of the public is participating in the system doesn't necessarily mean that they trust it or even that they want to be participating in it. So I think that's a, an important point for us to make. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. It's a, an important point. Um, now, Anirudh, uh, what about uh, modern technologies and, and, and the law that you're now working out in India. Is that a, a factor there to uh, uh, ensure the, the provenance and to be able to link the data to the people who actually should own it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the developments that have taken place in the last 10 years are steps towards that. And uh, I, I agree with some of the comments there that there are imperfections in what's been done and there is scope for improvement. But I think What's happened, at least in India, is that a lot of the public digital infrastructure that's been built has been built with the express purpose of being more inclusionary. Uh, and when we talk about imperfections, we should also keep in mind what were the prior alternatives or prior systems that were there, because the current system is far more superior to what was there before. So just in terms of participation and uh, inclusion, before the unique identification system in India, public subsidies, there were leakages for f about 25 to 30% of the actual uh, financial amount committed to subsidies. And that's reduced significantly because targeting has improved, because identifications are far more authentic and so on. So a lot of this has actually been far more inclusionary than it was earlier. And what we need to be careful about is that we don't curtail the scope of innovation in further technological developments like blockchain, for example, 
that can be more participatory and inclusionary than before. So for example, if we have uh, restrictions on, or if we have requirements of algorithmic accountability or legal accountability for running a blockchain system, and a blockchain system is by design supposed to be decentralized and permissionless, then how do you impose legal accountability? And will that actually impact the nature of development of that system and its ability to actually benefit people? So these are actually difficult questions and need a lot more deliberation. But uh, as you said, inclusion is key and financial inclusion, one of the, the big reasons that the trust is high in India. Uh, so Pam, actually, if we take India, that period of grace you talked about uh, in reference uh, to the pandemic, whether it comes to privacy issues and data, uh, uh, maybe that's, that's uh, even longer. In, in a way, um, it's also a, a question whether uh, privacy is a benefit or a hindrance sometimes. Is it an enabler to uh, ensure and, uh, maybe a better and wider use of uh, data? Or can it be seen uh, as something that's in the way of making the best use of it? So if I, I, I would like to address your question. If I may, though, add on to some of the comments about India. Um, uh, the India bill that's been tabled in Parliament is extraordinary, and it's, it's, it's quite thoughtful. It was developed in India with a panel of real experts, and they really thought through all of the data protection and data uh, privacy legislation around the world, and they, they grabbed the best pieces of all of it, and they created something wholly new and completely native to India. It, it is a very remarkable achievement. Something I think of, in, there's two items I wanted to mention about India worth thinking about. The first one is in regards to that legislation. It allows for very free use of data. There are not hindrances to data usage. However, uh, much of that usage is in the aggregate. And there are very strong definitions around the word aggregate, de-identification, and re-identification. And if the bill, as it is now, is uh, moved to law, re-identification of statistically de-identified data sets would be criminalized. And this is the first time we've really seen this in such a large scale. So this would allow for trust in the use of de-identified data, really well de really well de-identified data. And um, I think this is a very important point to think about. And I think that this can actually increase trust. Use the data, but do something to you know, remove some of you know, the risk um, with the data. The second thing I would say about data, um, India that's extremely interesting and we've followed very closely, which is the Andhra Pradesh Real-Time Data Center. This is built off of the backbone of the Aadhaar um, identity ecosystem in India, which is an extraordinary thing that I've never seen anything like it before. Um, but the real-time data center, you can log on to it. It's just for Andhra Pradesh. But um, you log on and you can see how many hospital beds are filled. You can see how many people are waiting in doctor's offices to be seen. Uh, you can see um, how many people have their bills paid or what services were delivered on time. I think these are very good um, things to look at for positive outcomes. And it is not identifiable to the, the individual. So I do think that there is much to learn from India um, in, in these use cases. Um, in regards to your question with privacy being an obstacle, I, I believe it's very important to situate privacy as part of data governance and as part of modern thought. Um, Privacy is many things. It, it changes constructs depending on what jurisdiction you're in. Privacy, for example, in Zambia and in India uh, and other jurisdictions is quite different. Um, in the US, we have a sectoral system. We do not have national uh, privacy legislation at this time for all sectors. Uh, whereas in Mauritius, you do, and it's a really strong law. Um, India does not have legislation. It also has sectoral, but they're going to have legislation. So this is on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if you're talking about broader norms, though, I think it's really important to unpack the norms and understand that um, there are very significant research exemptions. And I do believe that there is a strong social norm that if you are using data in a trusted manner for um, socially beneficial purposes, 
I think that that is something that if you can prove that, and if you can um, uh, make sure that that's documented, if you add to that in our era now, if you add to that robust and meaningful uh, public con consultation, this is very important. And I've really heard this uh, run through the comments of all the panelists, which is there is a very important ground up effort that must be made. And in this way, you can have your data and utilize it too. And that's really what you want. But I do think that there's, an, uh, again, an extremely important emerging issue. Um, and this has really been highlighted uh, with the pandemic. And that is the use of private sector held data for um, other purposes. So for example, um, in the pandemic, there has been an enormously productive use of telecommunications data in the aggregate. And when you're really looking at the COVID-19 data sets, for example, it is difficult to imagine the course of knowing about the pandemic without the use of some of the, the uh, telecommunications and geospatial data. Now, is this going to continue after the pandemic? That is one of the questions we must grapple with. If that is a yes, well then what norms, what regulations attached to that? We, quite, we haven't quite had that conversation yet, but we really need to. And I would just pose the question that, you know, the era of just say no to data use is over. That's been over for quite some time. But we're also not in what I would call a promiscuous data use era, the kind of Cambridge Analytica situation with Facebook. Mm -hmm. Those, that's over as well. I think we have the opportunity now to embark on a fresh discussion and to really um, tackle these uh, thorny issues with a, a feeling of cooperation. And I, I do think that cooperation here is really important. We've got to have these disaggregate statistics in order to help outcomes, but we've got to focus on um, how we get this done in a very high quality manner and in a trustworthy and respectful manner. Thank you. That's the discussion we'll embark on, and um, we'll do that uh, right now when we open up uh, uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, in the room, uh, please uh, raise your hand and uh, state your organization uh, as well as the country where you're from, who the question is for. And we also have already questions that came in on our online platform. One, for example, from Australia, and it alludes to what you just said, Pam. Is it only the quality of the data that we need to trust, or is it the data custodians and the actors in the data production and curation life cycle? Um, maybe, Dudesha, you want to take that one? Thank you so much. I think definitely they are all part of one chain, starting from the data steward, the data custodian, the data user, the data controller. They all have their respective responsibilities in that chain. But what is important to understand is that um, all these together, they have to work in a way which is collaborative because the data steward is not necessarily in contact with the data controller and the data user. So we have, uh, let's say, a diverse picture here that, and we need to unite all these people working um, um, in that picture, so that they come together, like we have in Mauritius, we have committees uh, which uh, supervises the data governance uh, framework that we have, and they meet. So it's very important that these people meet and they talk and they actually uh, highlight what are the problems that they are facing so that solutions can be found. But I'm not sure that this is happening on ground. This is why I'm putting a little bit of emphasis on the relationship that they share together. Like in Mauritius, we have uh, the Info Highway. Um, this is a data sharing platform for the government. And we are called upon the Data Protection Office and the other uh, partners to come together and talk on how these data is, are going to be safeguarded, what are uh, actually uh, the requirements, and how to improve and update the data. So this type of follow-up on a constant and regular basis is very important. It's not only the framework, it's not only the legislations, it's not only uh, one actor working in, in a particular field. It's about how they come together and constantly bring innovation to this type of uh, collaboration. 
Yeah, and I would uh, like to get uh, uh, Mr. Malenga, uh, not oops, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Malenga Mosepa's um, view on that because um, oftentimes the statistical offices, they're caught uh, in the middle of this, uh, this conflict uh, between privacy and accessibility, but they also can be at the heart of uh, bringing all these actors together. So where do you, do, do you see the role for the NSO in this? Thank you very much. I, I think the, um, when I started making my remarks, I, di I did touch on that. And um, for us, um, the basis is the, the national strategy for development of statistics. And then within that, our role as a national statistics office is to drive the creation and development of an integrated and coordinated national statistical system. Now, who are the members of the national statistical system? I did mention that uh, ourselves as the office, the various statistical agencies, uh, those that produce data administratively, the media, data producers, and suppliers. And uh, within the, the, the existing legal framework, we, we are required to have a forum, which one of my colleagues has referred to, where you bring all these key actors um, in, the, in the statistical space. And um, obviously, that, that means that for, for, for the data producer and suppliers, one of the things that you need to drive as a national statistical office is to fully, for them to fully understand why data has been collected, how this data is going to be used, how regularly will this data be produced. And therefore, we've got one part of, uh, of our role is to come up with what we call a national statistical calendar. And also, um, there, there is authority which has been given to, to, to my office where, um, where I'm protected from any interference in terms of, of the data. Previously, what you had was that for some data, for instance, uh, crop forecast data, before it was published, once it was collected, before it was published, um, it had to pass through State House some 10 years back. And then the president would actually look at the data and then he will say, okay, fine, this is okay, now go and publish it. And obviously you know that throws away the trust. And right now what we're also doing is that you see the police institution, for instance, the Ministry of Agriculture, that are responsible for producing, for promoting agricultural production, must step out of collecting data because there's a possibility that uh, one of the things that you may actually see in a number of developing countries is that you see data can be manipulated because otherwise they won't be able to produce data that is very bad and because they'll be indicting themselves. So the act, uh, as it were, um, the, the role of the agency is to ensure full operationalization of the act. Now, the implementation of the act obviously comes with a number of challenges. The challenges in, 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 most, in most countries is that um, um, you could have the act. How brave are you as the head of a national statistical office to say, no, this is the limit of the minister from issuing a statement on statistics. This is the limit of your own peers. Uh, who is your boss? So these are some of the things that we are, we are doing in, in Zambia. I think all in all is to drive the, the, the establishment of an integrated national statistical system where members fully appreciate the role of statistics, how statistics are calculated, stored, and the ensuring of the shallity. Okay, thank you, Malenga. I, we have a question in the room in, from the gentleman here with the baseball cap. All right, so now I guess I have to speak up for Facebook. Um, so my are you Andrew are you from Facebook? No, I'm not from Facebook, okay. but I know them very well. <laughs> okay. Um, my name's Andrew Schroeder. I'm from uh, Direct Relief, um, and I wanted to respond to the to the point earlier about uh, aggregated telecommunications data used in the pandemic um, and whether this would continue. I mean, I think it's important to get the history right here that this actually dramatically predates the pandemic, so there's actually a, a pretty well-developed a set of criteria for the use of aggregated telecommunications data in crisis response, which is why the transition was possible to the pandemic as rapidly as it was. And I think 
the telecom companies were the most challenging because they uh, have the greatest number of regulations. The, uh, you know, the work done by Facebook's Data for Good program through Google, through Cubic, uh, moved quite quickly um, and moved towards open differential privacy standards as a way to share um, private data in a protected fashion um, in a, in, into public data uh, portals, including humanitarian data exchange, so now you can uh, regularly get access to the mobility data that drives a lot of these uh, COVID uh, models now through the UN humanitarian data exchange. So I think this sort of connection around how we uh, use new technologies like differential privacy uh, with incentives and standards that have been developed for quite some time in the private uh, companies, including Facebook, um, is, is points a, a really significant way forward for exactly what you're talking about in terms of uh, wanting to incentivize uh, the use of these large scale data sets for public problem solving long after the pandemic. Um, one of the things I just wanted to ask your a uh, question about though is that when, when we've applied this um, in, in cases of, of pandemic uh, response with national governments, often we find that you know, there's a, a significant lack of capacity in many of our government uh, agency partners, whether that's ministries of health or emergency management, et cetera, in terms of the, the available personnel and uh, computing power, et cetera, to be able to utilize genuinely large scale real time data sets. It seems like investment in this capacity is primarily what's needed to be able to advance these uh, kinds of engagements that you're talking about. And it's not even clear to me that you need to do that in the agencies, but to develop partnerships that actually expand our definition of capacity. So I was wondering if you could talk about how questions about capacity investment can really fit into some of these questions about trust um, as you're developing the kinds of engagements that you've been describing. Capacity development, something we are uh, ahead of the panel on. Just yes, please. So just just a very brief response, and I'm going to leave some parts of that question. It's better better to Rudisha to the uh, NSO. Um, in regards to the use of um, telecommunications data, that's actually not without controversy. Um, it's well understood to be something that's utilized in emergency situations. The same is true with uh, a good deal of public, uh, public health data, as well as other health data, which uh, many of the restrictions have been waived during the pandemic um, in the US and in uh, many other jurisdictions. However, I do think that what we have the opportunity to do now is to have a robust public discussion about this when the nations and jurisdictions are not in a state of shock and awe from the, the brunt of the pandemic. Um, as we are able to emerge from the pandemic, I think these are absolutely crucial conversations to have. We should not make assumptions because even if the private sector has um, its own self-regulatory uh, schema, it does not mean that there are legislative uh, protections nor uh, ministry level protections. And I do think that we need to look at that. And as well, I, I again believe that the UN has a very important harmonizing function here um, to uh, really collect the NSOs and and really put the NSOs in the driver's seat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pam. I want to come back to the question as well so that we have a little time to ask more. Uh, Anirudh, uh, on the question of capacity to um, uh, really deal with the, the problems that come up, uh, especially on, on the government and agency side, um, what's the state of affairs there in India? Yeah, so uh, let me try not to give you a clear answer, but to give you both sides of the answer. Uh, one is a problem of trying to deal with a problem of the scale of a pandemic. And what that really entails is a very large scale diversion of all government capacity that's focused completely on solving that problem. And like you said, there is anyway fairly limited capacity to interact or to use that kind of data set to kind of uh, use it fruitfully and actually keep using it on a consistent basis. So what we've seen in India is that if you are actually on mission mode where you're actually trying to solve a very limited problem like a pandemic, you can actually focus all your capacity. But it's much harder to do it on a routinized basis, month after month, week after week, because being able to pursue that objective when you have 50 different things to do, especially if you're a developmental welfare state, it takes a lot of capacity. So I'm a little more sanguine about whether this will become a big challenge going forward. However, 
the other f side of this is that we should not take capacity for granted. It's not that capacity is going to be static over a period of time. The experience of dealing with a lot of these issues over a period of time during this pandemic is itself a capacity enabler and capacity builder. So governments are going to learn from how to deal with these kinds of issues, and some of that might translate into being able to process this kind of information better. And one example of this from a slightly different sector is the way in which governments are increasingly, increasingly trying to solve the problem of encryption and getting access to encrypted communication. What countries are doing increasingly is to actually ask firms to build the technical know-how and technical capacity to deliver a solution to en encrypted communication rather than trying to build it themselves. So that's an example of what the gentleman there was talking about where the government is basically building capacity in trying to work to solve a problem with private sector players rather than build that capacity in-house. Okay, and it's in constant flux, as you said. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> as so many things are these days. Here, uh, I think Johanna uh, is close to you, that uh, here we have uh, a lady um, with a question. Thank you, and I promise my question was written down before he asked his. So my name is Leslie McIntosh, and I am in the private sector. I started a company called Rupeda, which analyzes scientific manuscripts for quality checks. I come from a professor background in informatics. So my question is though, I am an American, I'm a white woman, and I am in a minority when it comes to women in technology and building these things. So when you ask your technological questions, um, how do we trust those that are building the technology that have the technology behind it? Because it is a select group, and it is a select group that doesn't look like me and it doesn't look like many of the people in this room that are building the technologies in which we are collecting the data that are not necessarily built by people who understand data, but they are built by people who understand computer science, and it's a very different angle of, of looking at things. So my question is, you know, moving the conversation outside of just trusting the data or trusting the people, but trusting the, um, the implementation uh, software behind what we use and where we gather the data. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, yes, Adrudesh Madhu. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to add that, you know, right now, what one positive aspect of COVID is that it has brought all the weaknesses that were, you know, are buried by national governments and even, you know, international uh, 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 arenas, because this is, I think, uh, a very positive side of the pandemic that we need to tackle right now our own weaknesses. It's not only about data, it's not only about technology, it's the pace that the world has evolved and is it correlated with what's happening uh, around the world today? Obviously not. I mean, we are lagging behind in every aspect of, of, of the world and technology definitely is very fast, but people are not so fast as technology is and governments definitely are lagging behind and people are just, uh, you know, at the end of a spectrum. So what is actually being called upon right now is how do we level, leverage the whole, uh, you know, uh, game scene is how to bring all the actors on a evenly playing situation. And this is not happening because at the international level, there is chaos. At the national level, there is even more chaos. So how do we reduce that chaos? And definitely, I think private sector has, because they have the capacity, they have the training, they have the resources, they have everything as compared to what uh, public actors have. So we definitely have to come forward with corporate social responsibility schemes, which have to be revised and bring in more social good and well-being of people in this so that we can actually together go and bring solutions which will benefit all of us. Because right now, what we are seeing, either for vaccination programs or even for technological apps, whatever you call it, is again economic interests. It's not always that we are looking at what people, at the suffering of people. This is not the case, even in this particular situation. So when are we going to realize that there is a point where we have to stop 
and think and say that yes, we need to put people forward. We need to think about how to, you know, protect people. And this is why we are always failing. It's not philosophical, unfortunately, but it's a reality right now, is that we are failing because we are believing that we need to produce that technology to counteract that situation. We need to bring in more apps. We need to bring in more, uh, you know, whatever. So at the end of the day, is that really benefiting the citizen, the individual, or is it really profit making? So let's strike the balance. Thank you. Strike the balance and put people first. I think that's a good note to end on. Thank you, Dudesh, and thank you for everyone who has participated in this discussion virtually or here in Bern. Thank you. I'd especially like to thank the, the speakers. And I think we have uh, a lot of ground that we've uh, covered uh, here, um, a lot of different elements of trust that we uh, spoke about. And these are certainly utterly uh, important themes. I'm sure the exchange of thoughts and ideas will go on for a while after this. Um, also remember we are on Twitter um, using the hand handle UN Data Forum and you can use course, the identical hashtag to chime in, UN Data Forum. So tweet away. That's it uh, for now. Or we end on time as always. Uh, I like that. And uh, I hope I see you tonight for uh, the gala evening. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Anil Arora, Chief Statistician of Canada. I'm grateful to be speaking with you from Ottawa, Ontario, the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. Along with my colleagues in the Statistical Society of Canada, I'm excited to invite you to join me here for the 64th ISI World Statistics Congress that our country is proudly hosting in 2023. Statisticians have never been more relevant to helping solve the problems of the world as they are today. That's why I want to see you at the next World Statistics Congress in the Shaw Centre in Ottawa, Canada in July 2023. There has never been a more exciting time to interact with your colleagues from around the world. We will have a rich scientific programme that includes invited sessions, contributed papers, short courses, tutorials and of course time to meet with friends and colleagues. We'll be attracting academics, mathematical statisticians, data scientists, applied statisticians, official statisticians, and statisticians from the world of business. Our meeting is open to users of statistics and contributors to our journals. We will have a space that will be welcoming to the entire statistical world and beyond. So here I am at Canada House in Trafalgar Square, London, in the UK. And I'm going to talk to Jonathan Sove, who's their Commissioner of Public Affairs. Well, Jonathan, we can only imagine what Ottawa is like. We can't be there today, but you must know the city quite well. Well, I do know uh, Ottawa quite well, actually, because um, it's our capital. What your delegates can expect, a summer day with, you know, temperatures in the high 20s and a very welcoming city during the summer. It is a relatively small capital, especially Especially the core of the city, very walkable. You can go from the from the Bywood Market to Parliament Hill in 15 minutes. You don't spend a lot of time in public transportation. That's quite important because yeah. coming and going from the conference venue to your hotel and then maybe taking in a museum or so or yeah. gallery, that can all be done easily. If you have members who are into, uh, you know, sports and physical activity, uh, there are beautiful paths along the river for a morning walk or a morning run. It's really possible to go from a very urban setting to a very uh, nature setting in like just like a snap of the finger. If you are interested in making good decisions using data, if you want to share your ideas with your peers, and if you want to learn from others, this is the place that you want to be. And we will want you to be there. So please do come and join us at the World Statistics Congress 2023 in Ottawa, Canada.